We truly get around these days, Joe. Copious amounts of water by the side of me. I think I've also spotted somewhere we can hire a boat. But what are we up to today? I hate to let you down, Gary, but we're not going punting on the river today. But we are here to see a really exciting project that's been set up and run by Whitby-esque Energy. Okay. And we're going to cross over the river and have a look at how they're turning the flow of water into electricity. Fascinating. Let's go. Come Let's on, go and have a look. the river we're here with Mike Ford technical director of Whitby Esk Energy nice to meet you nice to meet you too you're yeah, welcome so Joe it looks impressive it does look impressive we've got in front of us here really the heart of this whole system haven't we the Archimedes screw right tell us something about this this looks like the most amazing piece of engineering yeah well it's only about 2,000 years old but it's still going strong <laughs> uh, this is definitely the business end of the mechanical side of our, our generating plant um, we take about up to four tons per second of water through the wow. screw and we generate uh, 42 kilowatts as our maximum amount of energy. That is amazing. Yeah. And how, how wide is it? Because it looks yeah. absolutely enormous. It's in the back just there. under three meters. I think it's about 2.9 meters. Wow. It weighs about nine tons. It's steel. It's about maybe four tons of water in it at any given time. So a lot of mechanism going on there. That is incredible. It doesn't seem as if it's spinning that fast to me. No. So what's happening beyond the screw itself? Okay, well at the moment we're going flat out and it's turning at about 27 revolutions a minute. Okay. And from there it goes into a gearbox where it's speeded up 62 times and goes into a conventional electric motor which we use as a generator. We're seeing water coming off each side yep. and obviously within the actual screw itself. Is there any losses involved for that? Yep, I mean the, the average efficiency is somewhere between 70 and 80 okay. percent. That's from the front to the back effectively. Um, and those losses are from uh, hydraulic losses in the in form of friction of the water as it passes down the screw. There is some overflow down the sides at the moment and we also have some thermal losses in our gearbox. Right. And in terms of the environment, I mean, this looks like it's going to sort of chop fish to pieces, but actually, what can really? we say about the Archimedes screw? Well, there are no sharp edges that the fish can come in contact with because yeah. they're all sliding around the screw. Brilliant. So if a fish is trying to get downstream, it can enter in through the top and it goes into the trough of water and out the bottom. Wow. And if fish are wanting to go upstream, there's a fish pass alongside and they can wow. go up there. I'll be really interested to see what it's connected to the other end. Next. Sure, Thanks. okay. Yeah. Go and have a look. Yeah. So we saw that amazing elemental force of nature outside creating a turning motion of the screw. Yep. And that turning motion has now been kind of brought inside uh, this outbuilding here. And if you look inside there, you can see the rotation that the screw is causing. But actually here, it looks even slower than it did outside. So what's the next kind of step in this process of getting electricity out of it? Absolutely, as you say, the, the rotation of the screw is coming in through our thrust bearing and a coupling into this gearbox right. where it's speeded up 62 times. Yeah. Uh, it then heads off up through a brake into a conventional electric motor yeah. where we convert it into electricity and it goes out through this cable. And you can actually see, if you look through that grill, you can see that that is rotating really, really quickly. Absolutely, now. we're doing about 16.50 at the moment on Absolutely there. Absolutely brilliant. Some of the issues that isn't an issue on a November day is that when we came into this building, the ambient temperature lovely and warm. This is absolutely roasting hot, this gearbox. Yeah. Is that another one of those losses we're incurring? Mike? It is, absolutely, yes. Uh, from the side of this, you could, and the temperature, which gets up to about 85 to 90, you could probably make an assumption it's about four kilowatts, and that's about 10% of our total uh, losses. So, yeah, it's a significant loss. Yeah. It's interesting as well because I would imagine there's times when you need to shut this down very quickly. Obviously, it's difficult to turn a tap and stop the river from flowing. Yeah. So if we need to shut the motor down quickly, what's what's happening in this part of the machine? Okay, well, obviously we have things like power failures, yeah. so we need to be safe under those conditions. Yeah. Uh, the brake in here is just like a standard disc brake on a car, right. um, but the pads are held off with an electromagnet. Right. 
So if we have a power failure, the power goes to the magnet and the springs just clamp the disc pads onto the disc oh, and right. it slows down in an orderly fashion. Brilliant. So it's not locked, it's slowed down. There's a lot of inertia to slow down, so yeah, it absolutely. takes a few seconds. Yeah, that's really good. So that stops the motor. How yeah. can we stop the water from coming in? Okay, well, we're going to see that in a minute because yeah. we've got a penstock outside or a sluice gate, depending on how you want to call it. Yeah. And again, that will close under any, any conditions that we require to shut down, whether emergency or otherwise. Another thing, because obviously we're very interested in the environmental impact of this installation, because yep. we want it to be environmentally friendly as possible. You can probably tell on camera, it's incredibly noisy in here. It's fairly so, noisy, yeah. So what's, what's happening with the, uh, with the wall here? Yeah, well, as part of our original uh, talking with the locals, we yeah. discovered that we really need to make sure we keep this very quiet. Yeah. So as you've noticed on the screw at the bottom, it's got a solid cover rather than a mesh cover. That yeah. keeps the noise in. And in here, we also have sound lagging in this room to Brilliant. keep the noise level to agreed levels. Brilliant. Mike, we've got water outside. The last thing we want is water in here. Uh, yes. Is there any issues with rising water levels and any maybe considerations you took in the design? Yes, absolutely. Uh, when we were doing the design, we had a uh, look at the environment agencies once in a hundred year flood levels. Right. And we decided that anything that could be damaged by water would be installed at least half a meter above that level. Right. And you can see it written in big black letters on the door there. <laughs> so no electrical equipment yeah. below this level. And that explains why the, the motor it, it is, is more than up up The air. The air. will survive, the motor wouldn't. So the pen stops behind us, Mike. So when that's lowered to the bottom, yeah. stops the water coming in, maintenance can occur. Absolutely. Any other reasons or any other control measures that the pen stop can do for us? Absolutely. We use it for controlling the amount of water going into the turbine when we're at minimum speed. Okay. Because the water going through the turbine is proportional to its speed, more or less. So when we get down to about five kilowatts, we need, uh, we need to be able to reduce the water going through there. So the control system will gradually close the pen stop trying to maintain the river level at the upstream sensors. So if it goes below a certain level, it will increment it down and see what happens. Yeah. If nothing happens, it'll increment it a bit more until it gets to that absolute, to be within the two levels that the control is Am I right in thinking it's kind of a two kind of uh, layer control system? So this is almost yeah. like the, the initial crude control, if yes. you like, and yes. then inside the uh, facility, you've got the uh, more fine control of the flow rate yes, and the generating speed. Yes, in a way, speed. that's right, yeah. Once, uh, once we get above our minimum generation, uh, the pen stop will probably be end up fully open. So from there, the level inside the four bay, which was the level underneath the gearbox there, yeah. will start to rise and that will cause the screw to speed up right. and take more water, which will then lower it back down again. So it's a negative feedback system yeah. where increasing level, increasing speed. It's really clever, isn't it? Yeah. I'm also right in thinking, because we've spoken about the emergency braking system of That's the right. uh, motor yeah. inside, electrically speaking. Yeah. But is there an, another kind of uh, layer of safety on top of this as well for emergency kind of shutdown of the, the flow? Absolutely. I mean, when we have a power failure, for example, mm. we have to make sure we can shut down safely. Yeah. We've covered the brake, shutting the generator, but we also have to cut the water off. So there is a hydraulic accumulator, which I'll show you in a minute, which is basically a pressurized vessel. And if you have a power failure, a, pa a valve will de-energize and allow pressurized oil to go into the top of the ram above the pen stop, and it will actually force it down fairly quickly. Oh, wow. That's really cool. All fail safe. So really, we've now stepped into the control center, the brain of the operation, yep. if you like. So what are we looking at inside here now, Mike? Okay, well, first off, we've got the control system here. Okay, yep. Um, that's basically sending the commands to go faster or slower or yep. open or close the pen stop. And it's taking readings from our level sensors yep. in order to do that. And it's also connecting to the internet such that we can control it from wherever we are on the planet. Because this is not the most accessible nope, place in the absolutely, world. Absolutely, yeah. So you can actually sit in your lounge at home. Yep. And, and see exactly the same that we've got on, our, uh, on there. That is absolutely yep. brilliant, isn't it? One thing that does concern me a little bit here, though, it says uh -huh. we're generating minus 41 kilowatts of power. How yeah. are we generating minus power? I think because the system was basically designed for things like conveyor belts and uh, rolling mills, anything that has a variable speed drive on it, uh, that it was set up for consumption rather than generation. So it's a negative. That's the way it came from the manufacturers. Fair enough. So that's actually generating 41 kilowatts of power Correct. as we speak. Absolutely, what yes. What a fantastic system. Yeah. Now you mentioned variable speed drives. I did. We've got a reasonably sized one here. We so do. what's this bit of kit doing? Okay, well, uh, in order to change the speed of the screw, we yeah. have to change the speed of the motor. Right. Because it goes through a gearbox and is obviously linked. Yeah. So this basically connects to the grid as AC, 
has a DC bus in the middle and then connects to the AC motor. So we are effectively disconnected from an AC point of view from the grid. Ah, okay. So signals from the control system will change the speed of the inverter, basically. Ah, fantastic. So they're just communicating with each other all the time. exactly, yeah. And keeping it running yeah. at the right level. Yeah. That's brilliant. Now, you mentioned connecting to the grid, I obviously. Did. We think, you know, we love generating our own power and then volleying it onto the national grid. Yeah. But actually, there is some care that needs to be taken. And down the end there, we've got our G59 relay, which we is do. kind of a, a critical thing, really. It is. Because it's, it's almost like the last part of the connection between the generation and actually shipping it out to the wider world for you. So what does, what does the G59 relay accomplish? Well, anybody who connects to the grid as a generator has to make sure that they don't uh, provide power into the grid if there has been a fault or a problem with the grid. Right. So, for example, if the local area has become an island, it's been disconnected from the grid, yeah. you're likely to see either a change in voltage or a change in frequency, and that is an indication that you should disconnect, and that's what the G59 relay does. Uh, all right, that's very clever. So it's kind yeah. of like that last safety barrier between the generation and the... It is, absolutely. Grid. So it's looking outwards. It's yeah. purely looking outwards onto the grid. That's interesting. That's yeah. Fantastic. And just one more thing, you mentioned earlier about the emergency stop system for the pen stock. Yep. And is that what we've got in the back there? Absolutely. Right at the back there, we see a hydraulic power pack, yep. which is basically a pump, a reservoir and some valves. Yep. But we also have this accumulator, which is a pressure vessel at about, uh, up to about 60 bar it will go to. So there's nitrogen in half of that, that's about 60 bar at the right. moment. And if we had a power failure, one of the valves would de-energize and allow the oil out of the ram and the pressurized oil that's in there will then get forced into the top of the ram, forcing that pen stop closed. So we really love this project, it's very, very worthy, but of course, in order for it to be viable, it's got to be able to actually pay back the investment costs. Absolutely. And of course, some more. Yeah. So down the end, tucked on the right there, I can't actually see Very it. insignificant. Well, we've got one of the, possibly one of the most critical pieces Absolutely. of the We've got the meter, and what's that telling us about the electricity we're producing? That's telling us what we're generating. Right. So at the moment, 40 kilowatts over a year, we'll probably be doing 100 108 megawatt hours a year, wow. which is quite a sizable amount for, yeah. for the size of river that we're on. Obviously, yeah. the bigger river would be better. Um, that's about uh, 40 odd homes equivalent of energy. Wow. So we're very proud of what we do. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And that, that's the part that proves that this it is, is actually yeah. producing money, paying yeah. for itself. That's what we get paid for. Going. That's what we get paid for. Absolutely brilliant. Very and cool. like say, those 40 plus houses that are yeah. benefiting from the electricity produced there. Yeah. What a great project. So we've seen some of that amazing equipment that's been installed here, Mike, but we'd like to know a little bit more about the background of the project. Sure, so yeah. how did this whole thing get started? Well, I'm a member of Whitby Esk Energy, yep. and we're a, a group of like-minded people uh, living in the Esk Valley who wanted to reduce the carbon footprint of our valley. Yeah. Uh, it's originally from the parish council, but that's a long time ago. Um, in 2006, we decided that uh, one way would be to put in a hydro turbine here at Brussup near Whitby. Yeah. Um, and we did a survey of the river, found where the best weirs were to generate electricity. And this one has the most flow and an average head. So it was the best location to put in a turbine. So idea was there. So planning sailed through and we, we created the project that's in front of us now. Yes, I wouldn't say sailed through because uh, getting permissions, all the permissions for a hydro turbine is quite problematic. But yep. uh, yeah, it, uh, it all came through and we commissioned in 2012. So about six years from gestation to commission. One of the things we really like about it as well is it's a community project. Absolutely. So how did that kind of get started? How did you raise awareness for the project and, and get people interested in having a share? Right. Well, I mean, originally it was the parish council had the brainwave of literally a, a blue sky moment saying we need to do something about uh, reducing the carbon footprint. Yeah. Um, and they got in touch with the National Park Authority, the Norfolk North National Park Authority. And they were on board and they promoted uh, getting groups together to talk about what could be done. Um, so it was really an initiative between the Parish Council and the National Park. And reducing carbon is really, really important. Absolutely. Yeah. However, you must have created a carbon footprint when you built it. Yep. Did you allow for that in the process? We did, absolutely, yes. Um, during the uh, construction phase, we got our contractor to calculate how much carbon was embedded in the concrete and the steel and the right. diesel for transportation, this sort of thing. And uh, after we commissioned, we kept a tally of how much carbon we were saving and we broke even at about the 18 month point. Oh, wow, and yeah. how long has this actually been running for now then? Uh, since 2012, so that makes it seven years, doesn't it? Yeah. Wow. And after just 18 months, it yeah. was effectively carbon Absolutely, neutral. yeah. 
So is it fair to say that there's almost been a slight improvement in the quality of the wildlife since the project began? Yeah, in terms of the fish, uh, the five-year study done by the EA and Hull University yeah. has shown that there has been a slight improvement to the way the fish are attracted to the bottom of the fish boss. So we see that a good thing, yeah. So our project here has gone carbon neutral after about 18 months. That's right. Okay, it's producing a renewable source of energy. Absolutely. However, we must have had to finance this project. So how was that taken on? Yeah. Uh, when we started out, uh, we had a community share issue where we raised about half of our funds from the community okay. and half of our funds from loans. Uh, we had a business plan which was for 19 years. That's an unusual number, but it's basically when our feeding tariff runs out uh, would be after the 19 years. So we wanted to make sure that we were completely financially sound uh, while we had a guaranteed income from the feeding tariff. So the feeding tariff is paying both the shareholders a small dividend and also paying the loan back, is that correct? That's exactly right. It's coming into us as an entity, a financial entity, and then we pay a dividend, which is about 3% at the moment. So what we're actually seeing here is a project that is environmentally friendly, carbon neutral, it's producing a green, renewable source of energy and is also financially viable. Just Absolutely. goes to show what can be done yeah. when people put their mind to something. Yeah. What a fascinating day, Joe. Yeah. I had a fantastic time to see how we can harness the energy from water, thanks to Mike, to produce green energy. However, yeah. Mike, is there anywhere else that we can gather more information about your project? Absolutely. We're very proud what, as a community we've achieved here. So if you want to check out more about what we do, go to whitbyeskenergy.org.uk. And if you want to see what's happening at any given time under the generating pages, we've got all of the data that's currently available to us. That's absolutely brilliant. And thank you so much, Mike, for taking time out. You're very welcome. It's, it's been, been a pleasure. Really thank, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank so you. have I.